So welcome to the Back to Basics session on debugging. My name's uh, Mike. I'm going to be your uh, guide for today. Uh, I wanted to just start off with just this question, um, and you can throw out some answers. Uh, how much time do you think programmers spend debugging? Uh, what, do, what do folks think, or from personal experience? 60%. 60%. Okay. 80. Okay. Uh, yeah. Depends on the language. Depends on the language. Sure. <laughs> 100%, yeah. Some of us are full-time debuggers, yeah. <laughs> In some days, yeah. So it varies. Context um, certainly uh, counts here. Uh, but I want to actually give you an answer to that um, here as we uh, move, move along here. Uh, so for those who don't know, uh, since this is the first day of the conference, the Back to Basics session is sort of introductory level talks on different topics, um, usually exploring things. So uh, thanks to our uh, chair for this, uh, Klaus Engelberger. Uh, who gave the, the nice uh, welcome uh, earlier. Uh, but the answer to get into this uh, from 2017, so this data is a little bit old now, is about 35 to 50% of our time. Now, I've also seen estimates as high as 90%, depending on what software engineering you know, research uh, conference you're looking at. Uh, but I would say this is quite indicative for me of the average day um, when I've worked uh, in industry. Um, but regardless of what that number is, what I think is the interesting number is the budget here, 50 to 75% of the budget. Uh, so the economics of debugging really matters in our ability to do this quickly and efficiently. Okay? Um, but with that said, uh, you know, it sounds like we need to learn some tools to help us at this task, debugging, if we're spending a lot of time doing this. Uh, so that's what we're going to talk about today. That's what the abstract was about that hopefully brought you here. Um, and really two goals. So the first half or so of this talk, I want to talk about some debugging strategies, kind of motivate uh, using debuggers, debugging tools. Uh, and then the second half is going to be a little bit of an introduction to GDB. And I'm going to do some live debugging and just kind of work through some examples with what I would think is sort of a minimal subset of things that every programmer should know. And, and you'll really be able to get yourself um, in a good position and get out of trouble when you do have bugs. All right, so what you're going to learn today, uh, here's sort of the metaphor I always think about uh, when I'm talking about debugging or teaching it. Uh, for those who are familiar with the game uh, Monopoly, there's part of the game where if you get in trouble, you go to jail and you have to you know, stay in jail. <laughs> but uh, you know, I sort of say if you know how to use a debugger, it's kind of like having one of these get out of uh, jail free cards. Uh, you can just sort of escape, get yourself out of trouble um, whenever you need. Uh, and depending on how comfortable you are with these tools, how many of these tools you need, it's really like having a bunch of these uh, available for you. Uh, so this is how I always try to motivate uh, debugging. It lets you get out of tricky situations. Um, so you know, this is going to be sort of the, the goal and introduction to getting yourself out of trouble, um, as well as not just getting yourself out of trouble, but also understanding the program, being able to step through it and walk through it uh, slowly. I think that's another part of uh, debugging. All right, so again, here's just a little bit about me. You can read this later uh, on my website and so on. Um, but uh, I primarily do work in uh, C++ and teach as a, a professor. Code for this talk, if you just want some exercises, uh, are available uh, on the GitHub. I'll show this again later. And let's go ahead and get started with a good place to start. Uh, just talking about what is a bug. Um, and uh, we'll be using some characters here from Disney Pixar, great movie. Uh, it's probably 20 years or so old now, but <laughs> uh, regarding some bugs. So these guys are pretty friendly, but you know, we don't want them in our software. All right, so what are these bugs? Um, so the definition could be quite wide um, in terms of what a bug is, but in general, it's a defect in your actual software. Uh, now, this defect could be a sort of logical error, maybe how you thought about or approached the problem, an issue of correctness, so how uh, the actual result that you're getting from some input, or maybe even a performance bug. You have some specification where you have a hard deadline, you know, to draw something at 30 frames per second, or whatever the case might be, uh, but you're not meeting that requirement. OK, so there's a wide variety of different types of bugs and bug classes. Uh, today, I'm mostly going to be concerned with sort of logic and correctness. Uh, I'm not going to talk as much about performance, but there are some Back to Basics talks uh, from last year on uh, profiling and getting started with that. All right, so software bugs are faults or defects in our programs. And 
you know, one of the issues with these bugs is sometimes they can go undetected for a long period of time. Um, so, you know, they can be difficult to find based off of the class uh, of the actual bug. Uh, and just to sort of motivate that or show some examples, I'll show some infamous uh, software bugs here uh, that I think everybody should at least be familiar with, <laughs> again, to sort of motivate debugging, whether for yourself or maybe your, your team members, uh, if you're trying to get them into uh, debugging. Uh, so again, uh, you know, just a few uh, bugs here. And again, using the um, American game show Jeopardy here, <laughs> just to show about five of these. Uh, but the real first one I want to show um, from uh, Admiral, Dr. Admiral uh, Grace Hopper um, is logging the first uh, computer bug. How many folks know this story in the audience? About half, half the folks. Well, the long or the short of it uh, is uh, Dr. Hopper was working, I believe, a Harvard Mark II machine. Um, many years ago, and uh, the system wasn't working, and they kind of looked and tried to see, oh, what's, what's going on? What's causing the issue, the fault with the uh, hardware? And they had found that one of the moths uh, had gotten into one of the relays and was causing you know, a system uh, bug. <laughs> so uh, Dr. Hopper uh, grabbed the bug, taped it to the journal, that's the uh, moth here, and wrote, uh, first actual case of bug being found. <laughs> All right. And that's what sort of popularized the term, at least in software engineering. Um, I think the term had been used for a while, but you know, she's credited for uh, what we call bugs, you know, software engineers. Uh, so some other famous bugs, uh, and I'm just going to kind of flip through some of these, but again, showing that these are uh, costly, the Mars uh, Climate Orbiter. Um, this was an issue of getting the units wrong using, um, uh, I believe it was uh, let's see, uh, Imperial versus um, like standard uh, SI units. <laughs> so uh, they ended up uh, missing their trajectory by about 100 kilometers um, and of course lost that piece of equipment. So a very expensive and a very long uh, bug, uh, costly in terms of time for that uh, team that worked hard in this project. Uh, this is another one, I'll let this just play for a second here. <laughs> Maybe you've seen this clip. Uh, you can kind of read the caption here. The gentleman on the right saying, let's just plug in this device and you can, uh, the device driver will start running and it's uh, gonna just, and then he goes here in one second, load in the appropriate drivers. You'll see, or you'll notice, sorry, this is playing slowly. The scanner building, he goes, whoa. <laughs> and we all know what that is, uh, the blue screen of death here. <laughs> all right, so, uh, you know, this is uh, one of the dangers of a bug during a live demo. Um, <laughs> I don't mean to embarrass this gentleman. He's probably seen this clip a million times of himself, but <laughs> you know, the reality is uh, getting software done right is difficult, right? Uh, especially, you know, when you're mid-development and these sort of things. So, so we need some debugging skills. Maybe we could have you know, he could have caught that error or, or whatever engineers. Th this was the fall guy, I guess, but. <laughs> um, but anyways, uh, some other bugs, Y2K bug, another famous one you should know about uh, bug history, right? This idea that we're using two digits instead of the full year and banks were worried this was going to kind of uh, melt down our, our financial system amongst other things. All right, so many more uh, and costly bugs. Um, you know, various uh, space missions, uh, viruses. So again, security flaws could be classes of bugs, you know, not writing a correct specification. Um, Intel had a very popular sort of floating point uh, math processing error uh, many years ago. Uh, a Bitcoin hack where they lost 850,000 Bitcoins. I don't know how much that's worth today, but it's still a lot, <laughs> however much that is, uh, and many more. Of course, this list goes on to, you know, uh, minutes ago when I was doing some coding myself. So <laughs> all these bugs uh, going on. Uh, so lots of bugs. All right, so you know, with all these examples um, and all these great teams and you know, companies and so on that we look up to, uh, why are we creating all these bugs? What's the, what's the difficulty here? You know, why is software so hard here? Um, and you know, just to maybe hear some thoughts from you folks, uh, whether from your own experience or maybe your studies, um, why is it hard to write correct software? What do folks think? And I'll, I'll take hands and kind of wave in your direction. What makes it difficult? Yeah. Programming languages are complicated. It's complicated, yeah. Programming languages themselves, right? Uh, we have to think. <laughs> uh, yeah. 
yeah, customers think differently than developers. So um, maybe when it becomes a logic error, it's just a disagreement of what is the right output. Uh, yeah. And all of our developers think differently than each other. Yeah, right? We all have to have sort of the same mental model, right, for the problem that we're solving. Uh, yes? They didn't have common sense. Yeah, computers are, I'm trying to think of this, um, sufficiently naive, I guess, uh, right? They'll follow the ex exact instructions you give them. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir? Yeah, we like to just kind of jump in uh, and start coding before taking the time to sit back and think and maybe write out a design diagram. We say, oh, we don't need that. We've done this a thousand times, right? Uh, and then errors slip in. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So systems tend to evolve. That's certainly true, right? Technology is moving forward. I'm getting a new phone update every you know, few months or whatever. Um, so it's a moving target to figure out what correct is uh, as well. So lots of the code's changing. Again, many developers working together. Um, yeah. Yeah, behavior of unknown libraries. So whether we're either not familiar with them or uh, what they consider correct or their sort of uh, behavior, what guarantees they provide or don't provide, uh, right? Oftentimes, we're kind of looking um, or, or grabbing into a, a black box, right, and trusting, yeah, this, this system's going to do the right thing. Of course it will, right? <laughs> but that's not always the case. Um, so I think that's a pretty good uh, summary of what we've got. Yeah, one more. Sure. Typos, yeah. I mean, they could be, <laughs> I mean, um, and uh, keep, keep that one in mind. I'll, I'll give you uh, an example uh, that I will use here. Uh, but typos creep in, right? Um, I mean, as simple as, right, if we rewind here, again, the Mars Climate Orbiter, right? Maybe they had a units library, but they put a M at the end instead of uh, centimeters, and they changed that, and then got confused, just, et cetera. <laughs> so all these things cause uh, problems, right? Uh, so, you know, just, just some thoughts, and I think you folks, um, you know, covered this quite a bit, right? Software is changing frequently. Languages are hard, uh, someone mentioned, right? C++, um, and I think this is even outdated here. I think it's more pages. <laughs> so to understand every feature is, is difficult, right? We talked about developers thinking at different levels um, and having different mental models, right? Pressure, if someone says, hey, this is due in a weekend and you, you know, stayed up uh, you know, 24 hours and crunched, uh, that's not good. Uh, poor documentation, as someone mentioned, no, no comments, lack of testing, unanticipated inputs, all these things. You know, and the reality is we're, we're humans and are going to make mistakes. Okay, this is part of uh, software engineering. All right, so, um, you know, with all those things in mind, though, um, I still think today's topic is still a little bit too much of a mystery. So that's why I'm happy to have a, uh, a full room here to learn a little bit about uh, debugging here. All right, and you can read some of these there. You know, it says you might not feel like you can do much now, but you will be able to soon. So, <laughs> um, so again, today's goal is learn some debugging techniques. Um, and you know, this is just sort of a, um, a message, maybe maybe for those of you who have more experience here. Um, just we need to do a little bit more on computer science education to bring some of these talks, um, you know, to our to our students or to our teams, uh, having tech talks and learning a debugging tool or something. Um, could, could be some ways to uh, help write better software, okay? Um, so, you know, I try to do this. I dedicate at least a lecture um, a year, which I don't think is uh, enough <laughs> in my software engineering course. Uh, but when I'm doing a little bit better, you sprinkle in debugging, um, you know, little pieces. And that's the same way that I'd like you to learn it today. I'm going to show you a bunch of different things, sprinkle in a bunch of different commands, but you don't have to learn it all at once. You just sort of need to know some of this stuff exists sometimes. Okay, so that's going to be the uh, sort of approach uh, we'll take. Um, and with that uh, in mind, you know, some more wisdom from folks who are more wise than me. Uh, Dr. Greg Law confirms most of developers' time is spent debugging. What happened? Well, we looked at some of those situations, right? The realities of software development. Um, now, I will caveat this uh, relationship with uh, debugging versus testing as well. Again, sort of tightly coupled concepts, things that we should be doing in unison uh, together. 
Uh, both are necessary skills. So I'm going to teach you about debugging today, but that doesn't mean you just forget about testing because I said you had this, you know, get out of free jail card. <laughs> we're, we're still going to have to write tests and, uh, you know, increase the, the confidence that our, our software is correct, right? Um, so, you know, testing, you know, we're, we're checking for the presence of a bug, right? Given some input doesn't meet our expected output, okay? So we want to be able to use our tests and that's sort of the same thing we're doing while we're debugging too intuitively, um, but but testing means you know writing a unit test or or maybe even a, a proof or something stronger. Um, and debugging, what we're going to go through today is the process of removing uh, an observed fault in our software. So kind of finding the root cause, saying hey this doesn't look like it's right, um, and then actually fixing that uh, cause. Okay. Uh, and then usually after you go through the debugging process, you might want to write a test um, to confirm. Uh, that you have, in fact, fixed that uh, fault, okay? Um, and since we have the luxury of uh, speaking on Monday, the rest of this conference, there's a lot of awesome talks on testing. So I'd encourage you to uh, just you know, do control F and testing on the program schedule, uh, and you'll find some of these other uh, talks there. All right, so a little bit on uh, some debugging techniques and strategies, where to get started with this. Um, and this is going to be interactive as well, so you'll see if you can uh, spot some bugs. These are simple programs, right? They've got to fit on a slide, but I think they'll uncover some of the things that you folks mentioned about uh, you know, what kind of bugs uh, show up here. Uh, so let's go ahead and look here. Uh, and as we're uh, trying to find some bugs here, um, you know, here's sort of some of the intuitive or the strategies that you'd have, All right? So this is just called the sort of scan and look debugging, okay? Uh, so this works uh, kind of, you'll see. <laughs> um, so a common strategy, again, if you're familiar with the software, maybe you're the person who's been working on it, right? You're the lead developer or, you know, you're a one-person team and have written all the code. Um, you can just kind of find the bug, right? Um, and this I call the scan and look strategy. Okay, so let's, let's try it out below. Again, these are going to be relatively simple. Give everyone a little moment to think. Uh, and see if you can find the bug. Um, and all of this code compiles today. Um, yeah, it should be a, a relatively quick one. Um, yeah, go ahead and shout it out. So uh, is it the 9% the Yeah, we're going to get some truncation because we know about some rules that, you know, it's going to uh, convert this and drop after the decimal and so on, right? That's sort of uh, given as part of the language. Uh, right, and I didn't need to run this or show you the, the answer, right, of what's going to happen here. Uh, so if I actually run this, right, you'll see the value of pi is 3, right? Uh, but you intuitively are able to scan this code and say, hey, that looks, you know, maybe not correct. Or maybe just from this printout, again, by just scanning and looking, you get something that says pi is 3. You say, well, that's not how I remember it in math. It's 3.14, you know, whatever. <laughs> um, so, you know, you just kind of scan and look at your code, right? So this is a pretty uh, trivial example here. Okay, the bug's been spotted. You're able to find this. Um, you know, it's not a syntax error, uh, that type of bug, but, but just some kind of logical or correctness uh, bug here. Okay, we didn't provide the correct uh, type. Um, okay, so, you know, even if the code compiles, that doesn't, again, imply correctness uh, in our code. Uh, so, you know, this scan and look strategy, um, we're going to have to improve on this a little bit, right? So anyone can use this. That's the good news, right? You, you write some code, you look at it, and you try to uh, see if it's correct. Uh, but it's not necessarily reliable in that you're, you're making a guess <laughs> about what's, what's going to happen uh, to the actual code. Um, you know, and this strategy doesn't really scale well, right? It's going to work today because, you know, we have enough code that fits on a, a slide. Um, but I would say even once you get to <clears throat> a thousand lines of code, uh, this starts to break down, right? That's, that's even too much for me to process. And, and we work on scales of code sometimes in hundreds or, or even uh, millions of lines, right? Um, so the good news is that we do have a tool that can help us uh, with this scan and look strategy, okay? So this, this is sort of one of our, our debugging tools. And that tool is the compiler, right? That's something that sort of scans and looks at uh, all of our code. So <clears throat> scan and look uh, with the compiler's uh, help um, you know, can be uh, useful by passing in some uh, compiler flags. So in general, when we're doing development, uh, we'd want to use some sort of flag supported by our compiler, uh, right, with G++ or uh, Clang++ you'd use. 
dash capital W all to give you all the warnings uh, and even some of the extra warnings. Uh, and there's even some more flags beyond this um, that can sort of analyze the code, right? And maybe try to give you some idea of what's going on, all right? So if we do this, we're doing sort of scan and look, but our compiler's uh, doing this analysis for us. Okay, now more rigorously, we would call this some sort of static analysis, um, but these are also some uh, tools you would wanna add. Okay, so here it's saying, hey, warning, implicit conversion from float to int, uh, it's gonna change the value. Okay, so this one's common enough that uh, we're, our compilers and our tools are gonna spot it. All right, so again, the good news is, you know, our compilers uh, scale, so, you know, even if we have thousands or hundreds of thousands of lines of code, if we're actually compiling those lines, if we own that source code, uh, we can actually get some, some feedback here and fix some of these messages. And our compilers, um, over time, are getting better and better at um, giving us some of this information. So that's, that's the good news. You know, the cons, though, this is really only working at compile time that we're uh, capturing some of these issues, right? We have to compile and then, you know, get the warning um, for us, okay? And then we still have to make a decision about um, how to fix things, um, which we would have to do anyways. Um, and if we don't have the source code, if it's in a library, um, right, we don't own that code. So we can't look or observe the actual behavior, again, while our program runs. All right, so let's get to another strategy here. Uh, one that's even, uh, you know, better and, uh, you know, that uh, a lot of us use. Uh, printf debugging is the most uh, formal definition that I can find for it. <laughs> but what does this mean? Well, you know, we're uh, using printf, C out and C++23 uh, standard print maybe um, <laughs> to get some actual values of runtime uh, from our code, okay? Uh, and the idea here is that you can format the output uh, as you want here, okay? Uh, so here's an example. I'll give you a, a moment to try to look for the bug here. Again, try to use the uh, scan and look strategy. Uh, and then we'll also pretend we can't find it and then use some uh, printf debugging in a moment. All right, so our code's gotten even just a little bit complicated. All right, um, let me actually let you hold on to the answer if you, if you see it. So again, let's say we, we run this again and we say, uh, well, you know, our program's not uh, terminating here for some reason. Okay, I've got this main function, while one, you know, if the square of five is equal to 25, you know, we, we exit, okay? Something kind of trivial here. We would say, hey, we're stuck in this loop here. Okay, so again, depending on how much code I put on this screen, this, this bug can be kind of hard to find, but uh, this is where we say, well, why didn't our program exit? Uh, and then we kind of say, well, where are we doing interesting things? You know, we're taking a uh, square of five. So maybe let's uh, sprinkle in some, you know, see out statements here. Okay, and then we sort of uh, do this trick. I see my students do this. They'll put like an A here and then, you know, some value and then B and then some value. <laughs> and kind of get a, you know, general direction of, of where are you in the code? Uh, which points of the code can you actually reach? Um, and of course, you see this sort of message here, output one, output three, output one, output three. Like, okay, so that's a hint that output two isn't being uh, reached, right? So this is a kind of uh, debugging that we're doing here. Um, so maybe that sort of uh, tells us this area is interesting to look at, okay? So oops, uh, here was the error. I, I should have asked you to, to confirm it, but uh, right, our, our square function's not returning A times A, right? So we've just messed up on the actual uh, function here. All right, so, you know, with the strategy of uh, printf debugging, uh, my hope is, you know, th this is a useful strategy. I don't think I'll ever truly get rid of it, but I am hoping that you'll replace a lot of your printf debugging once we uh, start using the debugger today. Uh, but this is a strategy, you know, can help you sort of narrow down where bugs occur. But again, you have to think about, does this work at scale? Maybe, but how many, you know, lines of code are you modifying? Um, you know, you do get to observe the actual values, which is great. You get some idea of where you are, which could be useful, and then you can write your own, you know, pretty print functions. Um, but again, you're, you're taking educated guesses, you're taking time to modify, recompile the source code. Um, and again, even in small examples like this, um, it could take a, a long time to sort of iterate, um, let alone big projects where it takes a long time where you have to fire up a build system and do something, okay? Um, and sometimes you have to build out some additional infrastructure where it's not needed. If you're printing out or logging things about objects, maybe that's a good idea. 
in, to have in general um, for objects to have something to, to print or serialize some data, but uh, might not be needed, okay? And you also have to remember to take out those statements uh, later. <laughs> um, all right, so that's, that's another strategy. Another strategy here, delta debugging. And this is the one I think you probably were intuitively using in this sort of uh, strategy here, but um, this is basically your, your binary search for where a bug occurs, right? You run this program once and you're trying to figure out, well, where could the bug be? At least initially when you're first looking at the program, anywhere. Right? It could be anywhere in your program. But when we did our little printf debugging experiment, we said, well, you know, here were the statements that were printed out, right? just in this range here. Okay, and if I had some other functions here, like um, square root or cube or something, you'd say, well, those were never called, so you don't look in those places, right? So again, we sort of do this naturally, uh, what, what functions were called, okay? Uh, and again, this is just a general useful thing to have some intuition about where you're uh, executing, uh, but we will be able to do better with a debugger and actually looking at a call stack to see you know, which functions did we actually execute, again, rather than guessing. Okay, but still, still a good strategy to think about where is my actual program executing. Okay, so delta debugging, this is what allows us to sort of narrow our search space. You know, even if you don't have the, the source code, you could at least see maybe what library functions were called. Uh, as somebody mentioned, when we have third-party code, can we trust that? Uh, so you might be able to say, well, I'm suspicious, or maybe I should look at their GitHub repo or whatever, wherever you have access to <laughs> and see where you can fix things. Um, but this does sometimes require a little bit of domain knowledge, right, where you're spending time with the program to pick good uh, deltas here. All right, uh, getting into a, a few more strategies, and then we'll be ready for uh, debugging here. Uh, revisiting our printf. Uh, and trying to improve uh, using our, our programming language or our tools here, okay? Um, and this is slightly enhanced here, um, that you could use something like the preprocessor um, and utilize uh, or sort of write macros and textual replacements, okay? And I think uh, Bjorn might have mentioned during his talk earlier about, you know, oh, we're almost away from the preprocessor. <laughs> but sometimes, sometimes you use it, uh, right, I know folks might uh, shudder at this word macro, but let me show you an example here. Um, and I, at the very least, you know, maybe you have some of this in your, your code base, okay? Um, so looking at this sample, I'll draw your attention to this figure on the top right here. Uh, let's say we wanna, you know, run this code. We know there's been some problems in it, um, or maybe it's useful to have some additional output while you, the developer, are, are building the program. And then you have this little if def here. If def, you know, underscore debug, you'll print out this message here, all right? So this is an example of using your, your preprocessor to sort of turn on this debug flag and output some information, okay? And then ideally when you deploy this to an actual consumer, they're not gonna see, you know, pi is whatever value, right? Uh, so you sort of have that, that switch you can use, okay? Uh, so that's one way to sort of you know, do your printf debugging in maybe a little bit more controlled way. Um, you can start to add some more power to this uh, with some macros. Um, so here's an example on line seven of defining a little print macro, right? And our, our macros, if you're not as familiar, are basically textual replacements, right? So I'll put in print here, uh, the actual line of code here, and then we've got some built-in ones in our compiler that may be reliable, like underscore, uh, underscore line, underscore, underscore file. Um, and then the actual output here, if I draw your attention to the bottom of the screen, I'll say macro.cpp at line 16, value is 3.1415. Okay, so that's sort of a nice um, way to output some information, okay? Um, but again, this comes with its uh, challenges, right? Um, we can make our code maybe slightly cleaner in some way. Um, again, maybe with those like little print macros, we're not littering our code as much. Uh, we do have to be sort of be careful about turning things on and off, so our build process uh, becomes maybe more interesting, right? We have to remember, is debug on or debug off? Um, and even maybe just having some of these error checking mechanisms in your code base encourages folks to do this kind of stuff. Um, but you'll see the cons list I came up with got a little bit larger here. <laughs> you know, these, these things can quickly expand. We're generating lots of code. Um, you know, it sort of adds some clutter. Um, 
when, you, when we actually get into the debugger, sometimes you can't actually see into these macros to sort of see where did this come from, right? And you have to sort of ask this question, is this a function? Is this a macro? What happened? Uh, there are, are ways to do this with GDB that are pretty good, but again, we have to be a little bit careful. All right, so you know, that's about six strategies, or, or probably most the, the debugging process, at least that I remember going through. Um, before I really learned how to use a debugger um, and actually sort of step through a program, okay? And, and these are valid practices in some ways, right? You have to look at the, the pros and cons, right? Um, but I want your first resource to be, after today, hopefully to be an interactive uh, debugger. So I'm gonna go ahead and show you how we can use our interactive debugger to essentially get rid of uh, most of these strategies. And maybe in the extreme case, you'll wanna print some stuff off or, or use some logging classes or, or so on, okay? So my goal is at the very least not to have you scatter uh, little print statements uh, in your programs anymore. All right, so with that said, let's kind of move into the uh, second part of the talk here um, and, and look at an interactive debugger, do a little bit of uh, live coding here. All right, um, so this is sort of the grasshopper discouraging uh, the student here from using the debugger, but we are gonna use it, so. <laughs> All right, so here's maybe what an interactive debugger looks like, right? This idea that we're able to sort of step through our code uh, one line at a time. Uh, now today I'm gonna show you GDB, which is a free debugger, it's open source. Um, I would consider what I show you today on GDB similar to LLDB uh, as well. I'm gonna show you on the command line. Uh, but the principles that I show you, very likely your IDE if you're using Visual Studio or C-Line or even VS Code, has some integration so you can you know, do this in your favorite IDE. But I think GDB and doing it from a command line is um, a good exercise. Uh, and I'll show you it's probably more powerful than you think. Okay, so how our debuggers are gonna work here is you know, our debugger is an actual separate program, right? So GDB, what I'm gonna be uh, showing you today. Uh, and it works by attaching to an actual process um, and sort of instrumenting the program, um, which allows us to sort of step through or pause uh, execution. Um, if you're doing this on Linux, you might look into something like Ptrace if you wanted to sort of build your own uh, debugger. Um, the other part of our debuggers, um, which I'll uh, uncover here, is that our actual programs during the compilation uh, process are being instrumented with extra debugging information. Okay, so there's different formats, but the basic idea you could think about is every line of code that you write, there's a little bit of extra information uh, being added to each line. Uh, maybe it's kind of hidden in some way, uh, right? So we know maybe the line number, the actual symbol, uh, these, these are the types of things that are being stored somewhere in our um, executable, okay? All right, and how we get that debugging information, uh, which is important, is we're gonna add the dash G flag to our uh, compilation step here. Okay, so you remember G for debug, um, if that's useful. Um, and there are different uh, levels of debugging that you can do. We're gonna do uh, dash G, I believe that's uh, G2 by default, um, uh, which gives us a, a decent amount of uh, debugging information. All right, so running our programs with GDB. Um, I'm actually gonna show you how to do this, but it's in the slides, so you have uh, plenty of uh, cheat sheets here. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, dive into one of these examples here. Uh, again, using uh, GDB. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, you can use whatever uh, tools that you want here. Uh, but I want, what I wanna do here um, is actually run an example here. So let's see, I'm gonna use the uh, standard array example. Uh, and all these examples are in GIFs too, if you prefer those. Uh, but since we're live here, <laughs> let's uh, actually do the actions here. Um, so let me go ahead and uh, show you this program here. It's a standard array. Let's make this a little bit bigger here. Um, and again, the key uh, part here is compiling with debugging, okay? Uh, so you'll see this dash G uh, show up here. So let me go ahead and uh, I'll actually type it out. And let me give you an idea of what this program's doing. I'll leave it on the, the left side here. Uh, again, not a very meaningful program, but I just wanna show you how we can explore it. Uh, we're gonna create an array of five things, set the value of the first element, 
uh, set it again using some other you know, member function, and then just call some other uh, member functions here. All right, so first thing that we need to do is compile this, G++. Uh, I'm using these days C++ 17 or 20. I know 17's on this laptop. Our program and output program here. And what did I forget? Well, we have to have the uh, dash G here, okay? So we'll compile this, no mistakes. Phew. Okay, so, so far so good. Uh, and then we can run it, no, no real bugs or anything, but let's just say that we're trying to understand what this program's uh, doing here. Okay, so where are we gonna start? GDB, and then GDB's argument that it's gonna take in is the uh, program that we're interested in analyzing. Okay, so dot slash prog here. And then I'll hit enter here. And you'll get a bunch of information about uh, GDB here, um, some help resources, all useful um, stuff here. But we know we're in GDB now because our prompt here has switched to GDB. Okay, great, so what do we do now? Uh, well, now let's actually try to run our program. Okay, so here I'll type in uh, run and enter. Okay, and we'll see here, starting our program, uh, and it ran and exited normally. Uh, so cool, it, it did something. This particular program doesn't output anything to the terminal, so you know, we don't really have much. Um, but let's try to look at this again here. Okay, so instead of doing run this time, what I'm gonna do is type out start, okay? And you'll see me clear my terminal. I'm gonna do control L, just so um, it's a little bit easier to read from the top of the screen. So you'll hear me say control L, which clears the screen. Um, but let's start our program now. Okay, so I typed out start here. And again, we can see it's this interactive process, right? I'm typing stuff in and then our program's doing something. Okay, so we got this line here, temporary breakpoint one. Okay, so the first breakpoint uh, at some address. Okay, this is the file that we had uh, and we're at line 18. Okay, and it's gonna start here. Okay, so when we run with start, that's gonna essentially load up our program, do all of the initialization and then we're, we're ready, or, or GDB rather is waiting for us to do something interesting. And we can actually see here where we are. So we have some context. Okay, so our next command in order to execute this, I'm gonna type out uh, next here. And I'll hit enter here. And I'll say, oh, okay, move to line uh, 27. Uh, okay, so we have a little bit of context here. Here, let me help you out. Uh, there we are. <laughs> so we're, you know, we've sort of gone down here uh, to 27. And this is the next uh, line that's gonna execute. Okay, so it hasn't happened yet, but this is what's about to happen. Okay, so let's just kind of keep walking through our program. So next, uh, next, next, okay, and we're kind of walking through one at a time. If you get tired of typing out next, most of the GDB commands, not all, but you can usually, uh, the common ones just do the first letter, N in this case, and that'll move you to the next uh, line of code, okay? Uh, so N again, N again, until we get to the end of our program, and uh, we're done. So let's, let's restart this a few more times, getting a little bit more efficient every time. And again, part of this process, uh, hopefully uh, what you're seeing, is just to know some of these things uh, exist here. Okay, so you know, again, we're in this debugging space trying to understand uh, what our program do and we wanna restart this debugging process. So again, start, start it from the beginning, yes. Um, and this time uh, I can do next or n uh, for short and maybe execute the next uh, four lines of code here. Okay, so let's kind of jump a few lines here. And I say, whoa, okay, we're at my array back. Okay, so we have uh, line 35. So we can kind of look at the source code here. Um, but again, let's, let me constrain you here a little bit and let's just get rid of that. Uh-oh, right, you're looking at somebody else's unfamiliar code. <laughs> so where are we? You know, I don't have any idea of this context or if there's a bug here, what's going on? Um, so the next useful command uh, that we can do is uh, called list, okay? And that'll give us some context. So usually it gives us about 10 lines of code. You can do list and then a number uh, to get more. But we're, now we're centered around uh, this line of code that we're about to execute, okay? Uh, and we can kind of see what's gonna happen, you know, here uh, and what has happened. So again, trying to get some context of what's going on uh, in our debugging process. All right, so maybe now I'll do uh, next again. Uh, and I'm at size here, okay? And maybe I'm really curious about size, what it's actually doing here. Okay, now we can kind of execute this or, uh, or do something. 
But, but I want to know, right? Because this dot size, as we know, C++ programmers, there's something interesting going on here. It's a function call, right? So I can actually step into this function. I'll use step here, uh, and we do it here. And we'll actually go into the function here. I'm going to say, whoa, where are we? OK, so we're in this thing here. Uh, we've moved to uh, slash user slash include C++, you know, 10 array 175. OK, this is some piece of code I haven't written, but we happen to have the, the source code here. Now I'm actually looking at the implementation here. Let's try our command again here, list. Gain a little bit of context. OK, so now I can actually uh, you know, get a little idea of what's going on in this code here. OK, some other function that maybe your friend wrote, maybe it's from the standard library or, or whatever, uh, but you can kind of see into this. OK, this returns underscore nm here. OK, so maybe a number of elements or something or whatever. OK, all right, so now uh, how do I get out of this, right? This is the next thing that I'm going to do. Well, I could just keep typing next again, uh, and that'll sort of rescue me next. And then again, get a little bit of context with list where we're at. Next, next again, next again, et cetera, OK? Um, until we get this, you know, our, our program is terminated, OK? All right, so let me do Control-L here uh, and go back to the slide here. Um, and another run through here, OK? And then, then we're going to keep getting more uh, interesting here. Uh, so let's start it again. Uh, and let's do list here so we can see where our context is. Um, but I've gotten tired of doing you know, next, 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 even next four or whatever. Um, I just want to stop at a certain point in my program, right? Just execute my program until I get to you know, this spot where I think there's an error. So what I can do is actually type out uh, break, or BR for short, um, or B for even shorter, for a breakpoint. And this will pause our execution um, at a certain line. So let's go ahead and do break. I think 37 was sort of interesting here. Um, and now let's just type, um, whoops, uh, oops, I think I switched my window here. What did I do? Oh, no. <laughs> there we are. Um, so now let's just go ahead and continue, uh, or C for short. This is another one that has a shortcut. But I'm going to type all these out for you. Uh, and then we've continued all the way to our breakpoint at line 37. So again, where is that? If I type list, OK, we're, we're down here uh, at our size here. OK, so now we can move through our execution. And the break command's pretty flexible. We can break at a specific line, maybe a file. Um, I'll show you some conditions or a function that we actually hit. OK? All right, so let me go ahead and quit this and advance us here just a little bit. Um, so here's the basics. And <clears throat> we can actually get quite far with those basics. I mean, just running within GDB and seeing where we are is uh, pretty useful. Um, but let's do round two here and make it more interesting. Uh, and what I'm going to show you is GDB's text user interface. And this is when I saw this, I said, wow, GDB is pretty cool, and I'm really going to learn this thing. Uh, so GDB has a text uh, user interface mode here. So a couple ways to launch it. Uh, but let's do GDB a dash dash TUI TUI, or text user interface, and then our program. All right? And sometimes I run this with silent as well. <clears throat> just so we don't get all that uh, information printed out. All right, and when I do this, wow. OK, now I can actually see my source code. Uh, I don't have to juggle this thing anymore, so let's get rid of that. <laughs> I mean, it's all in one window here, OK, which is really nice. And then the same thing. I can type out start. Uh, and this time, you can actually see, oh, look, a little B there for breakpoint, and then do the same things that I was doing. Next, next, oops, next. Uh, put a breakpoint at, say, 37. Uh, Next. Um, and if I get, again, tired of hitting next, I can just hit enter, which repeats that command. Uh, and then here I am. I hit my breakpoint here, OK, where I am. All right, so that's pretty cool, the text user interface. So that's what I'm going to do the rest of the examples with um, here. Okay. Uh, now, if you want to see the other layouts, you can do help uh, layout. And there's all sorts of other uh, layouts you could do, like the uh, assembly layout here. For those of you who are you know, really uh, going into some debugging, right, and we can sort of do it this way as well. Uh, so that's kind of cool. Um, you know, that was helpful in my assembly course. <laughs> All right. Um, so let me go ahead and uh, move to a little bit uh, more of an interesting example. So this was on breakpoints, which we talked about. Um, and then I have to get you away from printf debugging, uh, which I promised. Okay. So we have a, a print command here. 
Uh, so let me open up another uh, example here. Uh, let's do GDB uh, CPP here. All right. Uh, so here's, uh, just for context, again, this program is not super, super interesting. All right, I'm just creating some objects, uh, a vector of strings, pushing in some random data into it, and then um, some more iterator stuff, and then maybe calling a function here, okay? So we'll go ahead and uh, practice with this program. Uh, so again, what I need to do, G++, I'm using 17 usually these days, GDB is the program here, and what I'm never gonna forget, Actually, let's forget it one time and just see what happens. All right, I'm really excited that I want to run this example. I'm not going to do dash G, uh, and I'm going to do GDB. Oh, we learned this cool TUI thing. Uh, run our program, enter, start. Wait, where's my source code? It's not available. Okay, so again, this is why we need to do uh, dash G. Um, so if you don't see your uh, source code uh, showing up, I need to exit uh, and rerun uh, my compile command. Um, and then, uh, oops, rerun it with dash G. <laughs> and then uh, launch into my graphical user interface. Now, there are ways within GDB you can run make and it'll rebuild things as well. Uh, so again, um, if you think it could be done or should be done more efficiently, there's probably a way. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and uh, take a look at this uh, program again by starting. Um, and let's see what this helper function does. So I'm already kind of curious about this thing at line 46, so I'm just going to put a breakpoint here at helper, okay? And you'll see breakpoint two is there, um, so that's available, okay? So that's at least one thing that I think is interesting. I could type info, breakpoints, and say, ah, okay, here's all the things I'm interested in at line number two. If I'm not interested in anymore, I can type like delete two and it won't uh, stop there. But let's go ahead and continue our execution. Uh, and then, whoa, what happened here? Uh, right, I'm getting my output uh, mixed with GDB. How do I fix this? Uh, control L, refresh the screen here. <laughs> or there's an actual uh, refresh command you can type out if control L is not working or you're on a Mac or something. <laughs> so either way. Uh, uh, and, and there are ways, again, if you say, hey, I don't want my output in the same window as my uh, terminal, you can output to a different terminal window. Okay. Um, so anyways, we're at this helper function, and this is kind of interesting. Um, okay, so... Uh, we're here, and then we're going to call this other helper function. Ooh, I wasn't expecting that. Uh, so let's step into that function. You know, let, let's see if we own it. Do we own the source code? Oh, we do. Okay, so it is showing up in GDB. It's not some library. Uh, and I have it uh, available here. Okay. Um, and let's go ahead and, um, I don't know, let's just go ahead and keep executing next, uh, next. Whoa, uh-oh. <laughs> what happened here, folks? Segmentation fault. How many folks know about segmentation fault? Yeah, unfortunately, most of us do. <laughs> um, um, but if you haven't seen uh, segmentation fault, basically it means we're accessing some memory we don't own, right? Some segment. Right? Our process is, you know, uh, given some fixed amount or, or region to execute, and we're trying to access something out of it. Uh, and null, which is, uh, I guess we could think of like a, a zero address. We could think of. Um, you know, it's outside our process. So if we're trying to dereference memory that we don't own, we get a segmentation fault here, right? Um, or at least that's what I think happened. I guess this example is a little bit too simple, right? We can kind of see it here. Um, but oftentimes what will happen is, again, you go through this uh, debugging investigation and you say, well, how did I get here? Did, was P, you know, in this scope? Well, let's check that here. Info, uh, locals, okay. So I can see all my local variables. Maybe someone wrote a really big function. Again, I'm pretty nice to you folks today. This is a small one. <laughs> so we can see you know, everything that's here. Uh, but we can see all of our local variables. And very clearly, we can see it. p is 0x0, zero zero, OK? Uh, if we can't see that, right? I said I'd show you print. We can just type out print p, OK? Uh, so there it is. Uh, that, that's the actual value in p, 0x0 zero uh, zero here. Um, other interesting things we can do. Okay, what if I, you know, do print star p? Okay, so trying to dereference uh, p here. Oh, okay, I cannot access memory at 0x0. Zero zero. Okay, so the print command, we can actually try to dereference things or, or use our other C++ operators. All right, so let's do print ampersand p, for example. We could see the address, right? And you could sort of go through this uh, debugging process here. 
All right. Um, so at this point, before I you know, rerun this program and try to fix this, um, I'm actually totally lost. Uh, where am I in the code? How did I get here? Um, remember, we were sort of talking about our delta debugging, trying to figure out, you know, what's my program space? I know I crashed. I know it's here, but you know, what were sort of the important things that I need to look at again? Um, and for this, a really helpful command is uh, backtrace, or uh, BT for short. Um, and what that's going to do when I hit enter is this is going to give us our call stack. Again, so we can kind of see what was important, what was interesting um, in our programs. All right, so if I read this uh, from top to bottom, right, this was sort of my path here. Okay, I'm in other helper, that's where I was. Um, other helper was called from helper, okay, and I can kind of see that in the source code. And then helper was called in the main function. Okay, so we can kind of uh, trace backwards uh, in that way and figure out, okay, these are the three interesting things. Um, this is also, you know, one of those reasons we try to write good code and um, try to avoid things like global variables <laughs> and these kind of things because it uh, makes debugging a little bit harder, right? There, there could be other things affecting these three functions, but at the very least, we know these three functions are interesting, okay? Um, all right, so let me go ahead and uh, quit this here. Let me check my check sheet to show you. Uh, let's see, did I show you everything? Yeah, most of the things. We can also print out hex and addresses and some of these things as well. Um, all right, let me open up uh, a question. Yeah. Print more than one? Um, oh, yeah, sure. Uh, like just automatically print all those variables? Yeah, there's a couple of things you could do. Um, Let's see, what have I done? In the past, what I've done, uh, and this is a little bit hacky, but I'll, um, you can actually define your own uh, commands. So I would define uh, a command for like print all or something. Uh, you get all the local variables and just iteratively print them out. Um, actually, what I want to show you that I think might be more interesting, right, because if you want to print or inspect more than one thing, um, and let me actually do this, this is a great, this is for the next uh, slide or so. Let's start this program and, I mean, let's just look at something that has more than one thing that's interesting. Uh, and that, that's why this object is here that's kind of useless <laughs> to show you this example. But let's go ahead and do next, next a couple times. Um, and we say, oh, okay, uh, O1. Okay, this is kind of interesting. So let's just print uh, O1 here, okay? Um, and as soon as I do that for structs and classes and these kind of things, it'll do a pretty decent job of printing out some of this information for us, okay? Um, and, and let me show you some other uh, interesting things with printing, uh, which, which are on here. Uh, again, maybe O1, there was segmentation fault, or you're like, hey, that doesn't look right. Well, let's, let's try to just investigate more of what's going on. Let's say, you know, what is O1? I don't know. Oh, it's type as an object, okay. Um, what's an object? Okay, that sounds like, like something super generic. So I probably want to look at my code here, so I can do focus source, to get a focus on the source window. Uh, now when I use my up and down arrows, I can kind of peek around here. Uh, okay, let's see. Oh, there's object. Okay. Uh, probably should have named this something better, but there it is. Uh, and I can have an idea of what it is here. Uh, okay, and let's type focus command. And now I'm kind of focused back on this window here. Uh, if I get lost, again, I can type list or, um, oh, I think that'll bring me back. Or, or if I execute the next command, it'll show up. Um, but again, um, let's go to the next one here. Uh, again, this O1 thing, um, I can also do uh, print the type out of O1. Um, and that's another way that I don't have to go on this wild sort of uh, search for what is O1, okay? So now I can just see without having to, the search, maybe it's in another file. Oh, this is what O1 is. If I print out O1, this is what it's populated in it and so on, okay? Uh, so a few more things I wanna uh, run through uh, in the last uh, five or so minutes here. Uh, let, let's do one here. Uh, loops, okay, so how many times are we gonna hit next here? Uh, forever, right? <laughs> over and over and over and over again. Uh, so I can use that trick, uh, you know, next 10 or something, but I can actually just do break uh, point 37. Uh, and then I can say something like if i is greater than uh, seven, something like that. 
Uh, oops, what did I do here? Break uh, if i is greater than seven. Okay, there we go. And then same trick, info, breakpoints, uh, and we can see that it's here. So now I can just hit continue, and we, we broke somewhere. I can print out i, and we'll see we have a value of eight here, okay? Uh, so just some, some ways to sort of navigate our code. Some other ways to navigate our code, again, in the same context, right? What context am I in? Info, locals, let's see where I am. Okay, these are all my things here. Uh, here's another cool example. If I actually, I'll print out this string in a second. I can just type watch i. Okay, so every time i changes, I just, uh, it'll show me, hey, what was the old value and what's the new value? Okay, we don't have to guess. In this example, it's pretty trivial, right? And I can just keep doing next a bunch of times. Um, and then let's actually print out strings just to show you how that's kind of cool, how you can see how this works. All right, let me get to one or two cool examples. So that's the conditional breakpoints, backtrace I showed you. Uh, quick question, yeah. If a I, I could set a breakpoint on like some library function. Yeah, so, so let's see. So it would sort of be like a break, uh, and I would type out like helper or something like that for the function, uh, the actual like function name that's called. Uh, I could do break, let's see if I try like free. Okay, so every time that we free memory, I don't know where it is here, but it's, it's there somewhere. So that's what we could do for our library calls. Um, let me attach to a process here, just to show you a, a quick one. Um, so again, maybe we have some program here. Let's compile it. I think this is GDB2. Uh, okay, I'm gonna compile it. Uh, and I need to split my window again. Uh, let's actually run this program. And we get something like this. And I say, oh my goodness. Uh, what's going on here? Well, let's actually see what this process is. I have to kind of grep for it. I called it prog here. Uh, and 23596, okay? So we have this process that's long running. Maybe it's a game or some like server application, something like that. Um, and then what I can do is type in, uh, let's see, from the right window. Uh, I, I have to be a super user here, right? We can't just let anybody do this. Uh, sudo gdb attach, and then the process ID, 23596. Uh, and oh, my password, don't look. <laughs> and I say, wow, the, the program stopped, okay? Uh, it stopped here. Let's again give ourselves a little bit of uh, context. Uh, oops, I didn't give myself, I didn't compile, I guess, with the uh, source. Or maybe I'm somewhere else where I don't have the source. So where am I? Backtrace. Whoa, all sorts of stuff's going on here. Let me see if I can try to give you a better view. <laughs> uh, and hit enter. Okay, so we're like deep in the code somewhere that's, that's being called. Okay, so I have my call stack. Well, let's just start typing up here, and that's a way to navigate up the call stack. Up, 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 enter, up, up, up. Oh, here's something familiar. Okay, so we're in this while loop, and now I can kind of print out what the counter is and so on. Okay, so that's a way to go through. Uh, yeah, question? You, you sure can, yeah. Uh, set val equals uh, one or something. Uh, now you're changing the behavior a little bit, but if you wanna experiment, um, that's certainly something you can do. Um, so let me just show you, I gotta show you folks one cool one. I'll try to combine this, um, but I need my cheat sheet here. Uh, and this is time traveling. Uh, so I'm gonna try to do this in one minute. This is an example uh, three. And this is sort of the latest and the greatest uh, with debugging. Uh, so this is, uh, oh, reverse, reverse. Uh, oops, where am I here? Oh, reverse.cpp, of course. Um, and let's run this with GDB. Our command here, oh, GDB, TUI, program. Okay, cool. Uh, so here's a, a simple program. Uh, let's start it. Uh, and this one I do need my, uh, my little cheater sheet here so I can see. Uh, target record full. And as soon as you do this, you can start recording uh, your stuff here. Record full. Uh, I think it's equals full. No, record full. Okay. So as soon as I do this, it's going to start recording things. So if I go next, 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 let's print out the value. 
And I can say, well, I don't like that. That looked bad. Uh, reverse next and go backwards, uh, which is kind of cool, up until the point where I started recording. Okay, so that's kind of on the um, advanced side. Now I know we're at like 20 seconds left. Uh, so, you know, there's a few more slides on a few uh, examples here. Uh, if you have polymorphic objects, kind of checking out the V table. Um, and then the rest of the stuff that I have here, right, this is our sort of summary, uh, is just uh, careful with debug release builds. Don't give everybody your debug uh, code here, right? Don't give it to the masses. <laughs> so be careful when you do that. Um, and um, just some general tips on debugging, right, how you write your code. But what I really want to share with you, too, is, um, you know, we can debug the code that we can see. When we start optimizing our code and that kind of stuff, it might get a little bit tricky. Um, and then here's a list of tools for debugging and other uh, talks from mostly past CPPCon um, things. Uh, and these slides will be available on my website in like uh, 30 minutes or so, as well as CPPCon. So Greg Law's got a bunch of good ones. Here I am again. Uh, and here's your cheat sheet from today. <laughs> so a bunch of Greg Law talks here uh, that we have here. Uh, and Bob Stiegel gave a great one just on debugging as well. All right, outside the scope of this, but there are GPU debugging tools, probably whatever system you're working on, you can find some tools. Uh, and with that said, uh, thanks for joining me. I hope that was useful. And uh, yeah, check out uh, GDB. <laughs>